Welcome into this Golf Channel podcast with Rex and Lav. In this week's edition, Rex is on the ground at the American Express. He'll give us updates on a field that includes five of the top seven in the world. We'll also dive in to the world of designated and non-designated events on the PGA Tour. And we'll talk Live Golf, which is reportedly on the verge of announcing its long-coveted broadcast TV deal. Rex, what is going on? In the Coachella Valley, it looks like you're at a very nice, nice Fairfield uh, residence in courtyard. No, you had Which it right the it? first time. That's good. If we do Marriott Roulette, Roulette, yeah, <laughs> it'd be absolutely perfect. It's a, it's a Fairfield Inn. Good guess. It's spacious. It's close to the golf course. Big fan. Two fifty two fifty nine a night. Uh, no, comes no, with, no. It was... comes comes with Starbucks coffee in the lobby. It it uh, it came under the two hundred dollar mark. But I sent you uh, a snappy you. chat earlier today and i'm very curious um what were your first response i i sent you an angry picture of myself and i, I gave you the option I, i'll give you five guesses you're never going to guess where i am you did not you tried all no, of them were you, very very good you said i'm pissed off i'll give you five guesses as to why i mean if you're on the road that this could be any number of any options number of the, the first one i guessed was that uh First, what I guessed was you got called back to the golf course to do a TV hit with Golf Central at four o'clock Eastern time, one o'clock your time. Uh, it certainly leaves potential for some breaking news and for you to for you to head back to PGA West to do a hit. Unfortunately, that was not the answer. The second one I guess second one I guessed was uh, there was some miscommunication potentially with the desk and what you were writing today. That was a very good guess. Uh, but but alas, that one was. Not <laughs> I didn't correct. write anything today, so that wasn't an issue either. So go on. <laughs> the correct answer. The correct answer is what, Rex? Uh, the correct answer is I was sitting at a charging station, and it was only for twenty or twenty-five minutes. So I'm a going to charging station the, for what? Uh, a Tesla, a car. So here's the deal. I fly in when I come to this event, and I've done this event the last couple of years. Instead of taking a connecting flight from wherever that might be, Salt Lake City, Atlanta, whatever the case may be, I fly Salt Lake direct. City. Do not do not fly into Salt Lake City this time of year. Not right now. Uh, so I fly direct to L.A. from Orlando. It's a direct flight. It's an easy flight. Get off, and it's a two-hour drive over here. Very very simple. I've done it the last couple of years. No fuss, no muss. I got off the plane on Monday morning, essentially, and walked into the Hertz lot. And because we, we rent a lot of cars, you're in the president's circle. So of the line of cars in the president's circle I could choose from, no it big was deal. 20. No big deal. I'm just in the president's circle. Yeah, no big deal. The, it, as far as a, a <laughs> mellow a flex, flex, guys. What a flex. What a flex. If you were, if you were, uh, if you were, if you were a single bachelor <laughs> at this point, what do, you, what do you do for a living? You know, I we're at the golf channel. I got a president's circle. No big deal. Uh, <laughs> I'm also, I'm also a Delta elite. <laughs> They got the How's titanium, that go? Diamond. titanium American car. Diamond Delta. What's the matter with you? How do you think that's going to go over at a party? I don't think that's going to work very well. <laughs> real, but real of the 20 up, cars, please. of the 20 cars in this line, I can choose from 17 are Teslas. And only three of them are traditional gas guzzling cars. And I looked at all three of the gas guzzling cars, and they were all old, and they were kind of dirty, and one didn't have a USB port. This is our wall. usual Hertz? This is the normal Hertz at LA Airport, LAX, which you've gone to a number of times. So finally, and I had a little bit of time on Monday. I wasn't under you know, any time constraints. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it. Everyone want, everyone's curious about Tesla. I don't know about you. I was curious. First and foremost, it took me 20 minutes to even figure out how to make the car move. <laughs> help. Someone help me. <laughs> I got up, walked around the car four or five times, looked around, had called my son, had him Google, like, do me a favor, like, Google how do you start a Tesla? Like, there, is there some sort of magic trick I have to do here? So I finally got, got it started. It's, it's a very tricky pro process, but there is information out there if you go looking. So now I get it started. Now I'm on the highway, and it's about a two-hour drive. It's about, Aren't Teslas like 100K? Uh, I mean, I think they're very expensive cars, or at least they used to be before and Elon just... Musk stopped being an executive and started being a, a Twitter troll. But I think... What happens is you have a lot of these that flooded the market, and now people are selling them back, and so you have Hertz is turning them into rental cars. It's great, good for the environment. Never Fantastic. seen a Tesla rental car. I'm I'm Tesla. stuck. I'm not. I wouldn't say stuck. I'm. I got a Kia. I've got a Toyota Corolla. Uh, I've got some sort of Honda, like CRV. All fine. They're in the inter intermediate category, which is what I'm supposed to be allowed. Not not present circle intermediate. That's a that's a that's a weird flex for you. Intermediate. Uh, <laughs> But I didn't really panic until I was on the road to Palm Springs from L.A. And again, it's about a two-hour drive. It's about 120, 130 miles, whatever the case may be. And I looked down, and on the computer screen, which is all there essentially is in the car, 
it says that I have uh, 78% of battery left. And like, I'm trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? So I call my son again and have him Google, like, what, what do I do here? And finally, because I did figure out how to make the Bluetooth work. So finally, I have a friend that lives in Southern California who owns one. So he, I called him and he taught me through the process. And it, it actually works out well. That you just kind of punch in your destination on the computer screen. And it tells you if you have enough charge to get there, you're fine. If not, it gives you options along the way to stop and recharge. Did not need to how, stop to recharge. How long is it charge? Okay. How long is it charge? So I, I did not know. So I get done at the golf course today. As you pointed out, it was it was an early show for us, 1 o'clock. So I'm done by 1.30, 2 o'clock. And so I had some work I could just do on my computer. So now I got to drive around La Quinta and Palm Springs trying to find a charging station. Apparently, that's not the easiest thing. So then I, I plug in the charger. Don't even know if it's working. Got to ask the guy next to me if I'm doing this right. Like, <laughs> the, the, is it, this is, it, is me being... Is it not like a golf cart charge where you just like plug in the it plug is, the thing but and the, go? It's not like the car talks to you and he's like, okay, I'll be charged in 20 minutes. Like you had to kind of, I had to kind of guess. And sure enough, it charged and it took about 20 or 25 minutes. So I'm fine. I that is outrageous. How it, <laughs> takes that it takes 20, 20 minutes to charge? Yes. Yes. I don't, I don't understand why people, if you have it. Why would you ever you, have this? Well, if you have it and all you do is kind of commute to the office or whatever the case may be, and it's a short commute and you can plug it in in your garage, totally fine with it. Like, oh, that's cool. I, I get it. I understand. Like, it, it works well. If you have to do any kind of driving whatsoever, what if you're stuck like, in traffic? I'm, I'm going to stop on the way to Palm Springs and charge it for 20, 25 minutes. What if I'm on a time constraint here? This is one of the most outrageous. Why would you buy this other than just the flex to say you have a Tesla? I mean, people love these things. I, I don't know what to a tell 20 you. Twenty I mean, minute break. Uh, I at get, least twenty I get, minutes. I get, I get mad at the gas station if you're pumping and it's like it just trickles along with the sense, you know, like oh come on, got the slowest pump ever. You're talking about twenty minutes. Well, and it charges you when you're at this station, and apparently you have an account that's registered to your car, so apparently Hertz is going to get charged for this one. So for my, it, my or battery wouldn't. <laughs> someone's getting fully charged. <laughs> It, it, it turns out that we're going to get to golf here in a second. My battery won't charge past 80%, which is another issue that's going to make me nervous as the week goes on. Like, oh, well, what's wrong with my battery here? And it only cost me $12, though, to charge it to 80%. So you, you see the cost savings there, right? Huh. However, 80% is 222 miles. I can tell you that. So if $15 gives you 222 miles, that's very efficient compared to what we're paying for gas right now. This is the dumbest car I've ever heard. So you can't drive more than 220 miles without a charge. All right. It's at Ryan Labner GC. Everyone drop right into his mentions with Elon that Musk. screaming no. hot take that Tesla is the dumbest car This ever. sounds like it, an incredibly dumb car. It, uh, it was, not an, it, it, it was again, 20, 25 minutes out of my life. It's fine. I could do work in the car. I, give, I was me my, give me my you. Kia sedan. <laughs> give me my Apple CarPlay. That's literally all I need in a rental car. My my six dollars. I still can't somehow. I turn. There's a heater on the steering wheel, and I somehow turn it on. I can't figure out how to turn it off. I don't know how to make the, like it's very cold out here, by the way. And so I couldn't figure out how to turn the defroster on this morning because there's there's too much. Someone tells me that Joey from accounting is going to ask a why you had a Tesla, b why you weren't following the guidelines for an intermediate car, and c uh, your little twelve dollar gas charge. <laughs> To fill up it's the eighty percent, which is two hundred and twenty miles, is going to be coming back to bite you. Something, 15, something tells me. Something tells me Joy from accounting is going to be <laughs> going to be blowing you up. It's two hundred twenty-two miles for fifteen miles. Like that's cost effective. Like you can say what you want about the car, and I was aggravated. I, I'm not going to lie about that. But for fifteen dollars, you get two hundred twenty-two miles. You do the math. So when you're trying to catch your red eye on Sunday night, and you don't have. Wow. You, you don't have 80%. You get stuck in traffic. You're going to have to go find a charging station for 30 minutes so you can get back up to your $15 and your 220 miles. Meet me on Just, camera one, America. This is going to be the look on my <laughs> This is going to be the look on my face. <laughs> Joey, Joey from County. It's rex.hoggard at NBCUni.com. Uh, sure Trust me. He, he knows it. We, we've... <laughs> He, we've had, he is also getting per had. diem, folks. He's getting $60 a day uh, in <laughs> per diem. Uh, Rex, we will get to the golf at this point after this nine-minute interlude. Uh, five <laughs> of the top seven players in the world. You could probably guess the two who are not here. That would be Roy McIlroy, the world number one, who is actually in danger of losing that top spot this week, as well as Live Golf's Cameron Smith, who is not playing on the PGA Tour this year. Or probably uh, The better number is 10 out of the top 20. 
Actually, I used 10 out of the I top saw eight, 20 today. I saw 8 of the top 15. However you want to slice it, Rex. That's this good. This is the strongest field in more than two decades, I believe, at the American Express, a.k.a. the former Bob Hope Classic. What's, what's the reason? What's the explanation? Why are so many top players turning up to an event that is not a designated event on the PJ Tour schedule? I did this twice today, one for Golf Today and one for Golf Central, so I can do it in a 90-second window right here. And I actually... Uh, it, uh, I talked to Will Zalatoris about this, and he had a, he had a really good take on it. essentially what has happened with the designated events. If you look at the window that this has created specifically for this event, now we can go into the schedule and sort of dig down and see if this is going to happen again. But you essentially have a month, four events between the first designated event of the year, which was Maui, the Century Tournament of Champions, and the second of the year, which is going to be uh, Phoenix. And so what you're telling these players that, all right, we're making you sort of focus on these 20 events going forward, the designated events, and then you can play whatever you want beyond that. For players, it just makes sense. They probably didn't want to play Sony because either if you weren't Maui, you're not going to fly all the way out to Honolulu to do that. Toy Pines is sort of an acquired taste. You're playing two golf courses. It starts on Wednesday. That's got a pretty good feel as well based on the early commitment list. Pretty good. I don't know how good it's going to be when it's all, all... sorted out i think toy pines is actually going to take a hit on this or pebble beach which we all know can get weird weather i think this is a direct beneficiary of the idea that look that designated schedule what we're talking about this year and it, we're in transition we don't know exactly what it's going to look like but american express is a beneficiary of that because you have players that probably wouldn't have been here if they weren't in the situation well we had to play maui we have to play Phoenix. We've got to play the next week in Los Angeles, and then we start turning to the Florida swing, which, again, then you have the Arnold Palmer Invitational and the players. All these start stacking up at some point. I don't think – I kind of glanced at the schedule. I don't think there's a month in between designated events the rest of the year, which means this is sort of a unique opportunity that we – I mean, you couldn't have foreseen this coming, and I don't even think – I talked to the tournament director today. He, he was confident he would get a good feel, but he didn't expect this. No, I agree with you. I, I certainly think there's some factors working in here. Obviously, the schedule uh, benefits it there where you, you're talking about a month between designated events. Uh, I know this week is a little bit colder, and by colder, I mean low 60s for those of us uh, who are who had frost warnings this morning like we did here in Jacksonville or those in the Northeast who are uh, buried under snow or potentially in the Pacific Northwest uh, where you're currently dealing with mudslides. You probably don't have all that much sympathy for dry and 63 degrees uh, and sunny, however, it is a good opportunity for these guys to get some uh, competitive reps under the belt if they hadn't played a whole lot over the past six, seven weeks uh, with the holidays. Um, some players, probably not all of them, uh, like the Pro-Am format, guaranteed three rounds, 54 holes, and then you cut uh, on Saturday going in to the final round on Sunday. So I think a lot of that has to do with it. I believe there's a tie Rex with Sport 5 with the management company. It's getting a lot of – it's funneling uh, some of the players in the tournament as well. And I, I think – and we can dig into this further. I think two guys just want to check off that not that three non-designated mm-hmm. tournament start requirement. Now, a lot of guys uh, guys are able to skip at least one, but getting – say you got one under your belt uh, in the fall with the CJ Cup – now you can knock off the American Express at a time of year that is uh, beneficial for everyone. Those guys are in very good position because I think it's going to be a different conversation when we look in the, in the late spring and the summer when you start looking you know, after the U.S. Open. It's, it's Traveler's designated event, and then it goes Rocket Mortgage, John Deere, uh, Scottish Open, uh, Open Championship, 3M, Wyndham, before you get to the FedEx Cup playoffs. You don't want to be in a situation if you're a top player to have to squeeze one of those events in uh, when you're probably burned out from major season and then going into the very lucrative postseason. I think there's certainly a lot of factors in play here. And I think there's something to be said for the idea that this is golf in a dome. Since this tournament started in 1960, it was a good place for players to come and start their season where they were pretty much guaranteed sunshine and little wind and just a lot of calm, warm conditions. Now, that's changed a little bit. I was so proud of myself. If we're playing sort of uh, Weather Channel bingo here, for me to be able to sneak into both the, the Golf Today telecast today and Golf Central, atmospheric river. How about that? Well done. Like Steve Burko, uh, Burko, uh, Burko <laughs> is at home right now, so Burko. angry that I was at – Burko is so angry right now that I was able to sneak that in there because that's, that's right in his me? wheelhouse. You kidding me? This guy gets a Pineapple Express. <laughs> <laughs> I got Dracio Storm. 
I got Derecho Storm a few years ago, and now I have Atmospheric River. And uh, it's going to be a little different this week. It's actually going to, it, ne- it doesn't get out of the six, uh, above like 61, 62. Uh, there's no rain, but I think wind will be a factor, at least on Thursday and Friday. But other than that, it's what you've come to expect from this tournament. And you're right, guys want to come here. I, an interesting element that I didn't even think of today was sitting on the range talking with players and reps. It's also the first time this year that they've had access to the trailers. Like the, the tour trailers obviously don't go to Maui. They don't go to Honolulu. So all the players who are looking to you know make equipment swaps, this is the week to do it. Rex, what do you make of all the hand-wringing that we, when the when this when this designated tournament schedule, this, this new look PJ Tour schedule was unveiled, I believe, the Tour Championship last August. There's a lot of hand-wringing about how there's going to be an A Tour and a B Tour. I've always been of the opinion that that has always been the case. You know, you think back to when Tiger Woods was in his prime. I mean, there were Tiger events and there were non-Tiger events. The vibe on the golf course at the tournament in the media center was vastly different when Tiger was in the field than when he is not. So there's always been a separation between the upper class and the middle class. Now the tour is just explicitly stating that there is a separation in status. Now, this is a very small sample. This is week three of a 2023 PGA Tour schedule. But right now, at least, it seems like business as usual, does it not? Like the Century Tournament of Champions has always had a feel of a limited invitational because it was. The spots were reserved for tournament winners, and now you have the addition of the Tour Championship qualifiers as well. Now it just has a $15 million bloated purse. But the Sony Open last week had nearly as many top 50 players, 14, as they had last year, which was 16. You still had Tom Kim. You still had Jordan Spieth with the headliners. And you saw, certainly on Sunday, I would call it an an eclectic leaderboard with a lot of players uh, battling it out for their first PGA Tour victory. And CJ uh, Siwoo Kim ended up edging Hayden Buckley for the title, but that's that's kind of what you're going to get, right? Like a John Rahm was a de- designated event, and then a Siwoo Kim, kind of the player on the periphery trying to break back into that top player or elevated status uh, tournament, and the winning the Sony. So is this what we can kind of expect, where the golf world's attention is really heightened at an event like Kapalua, and then we kind of turn off it with Wiley and... It's really just the hardcore fans who are eager to learn more, more about the next wave of players who tune in. Like, what? How do you kind of see this evolving through the course of the season? How's that new mic stand treating you? You look like you're comfortable. Look like it. your arm's not cramping at all. Well, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I can I can feel my hand. I, I, I don't even know what to do with my hands. Like, woo! <laughs> Imagine is, me. This is, this is, a, this is a visual medium now, and I do not have to use my hands if I, if, I don't, if I don't want to. Now, if I have to make a point, I'll go ahead and throw up the sausage finger, but at least I don't have to move the mic stand with me. Imagine me trying to sneak an expensive port through with uh, some therapy on my carpal tunnel <laughs> syndrome because I'm holding up the five-pound mic for 45 minutes. $150 every two weeks. <laughs> Seems <laughs> Just buy him a mic stand, for God's sake. Uh, I did get a mic stand. I'm on the road. That's why I don't have it with me. But that one, that one looks very good. It took you a minute to put that in, didn't it? Oh, YouTube videos... Instruction, instruction manuals. This thing definitely could collapse at any time. It is, it is a heavy-duty mic stand. I was not totally aware this was gonna, what it's going to look like. Uh, I must say that I'm quite pleased. I'm just also waiting for it to collapse. <laughs> not like you had to do YouTube searches to come up with videos like I had to yep. start the car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to hook this in where? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is absolutely nothing new. I, we had a, I had a conversation earlier today with Trip Eisenhower, who's one of the analysts uh, for us at Golf Channel, where when he was still playing on the tour, he I actually interviewed him for a story that I was working for, and this was back in when I was still working for a magazine, about the idea that there were two separate tours, and I actually broke it down. So the, the tour that Tiger was playing, he was playing for, and I don't remember what the exact numbers were, but let's say $50 million in purses. The tour that Trip was playing for that year, which was also the PGA Tour, but vastly different tournaments, added up to like $15 million. Like it was, it was a massive difference just based on money alone. Like take everything else out of it. Take out the prestige and playing majors and WGCs and everything else. It was just a vastly different tour. They just put a name to this. Is all they've done. And yes, I think what, what we saw in Maui is probably a really good indication of what these designated events are going to look like going forward. Because the whole idea behind this was you're going to get the top players together 
more often and you're going to get those scenarios that make for that sort of magical Sunday afternoon when you have a Colin Morikawa and a John Rahm going head to head in a primetime event. It's exactly what the tour wants and exactly what the tour needs. Now, and we'll get into this as the year goes by and, and players start to speak their minds a little bit because there already are grumblings. Certainly James Hahn has been the first to sort of talk about the idea that you're creating a secondary tour, if not a secondary class of tour players. And there's also the worry of how do you play your way in to that designated status? It's it's sort of, it's very gray how exactly you become one of those players because I don't think anyone outside of Ponte Vedra headquarters understands exactly how the PIP works. So there's some things that need to get sorted out, but in the long term, I think this is going to be good for the PGA Tour. This is the first PGA Tour event I believe you've covered in, in two months. Just your second uh, since August, I want to say. Are, are you? And what, what we keep hearing, Rex, is that the 2023 PGA Tour season is a bridge to 2024, and that's when the PGA Tour is supposed to unveil what its future schedule is supposed to look like and beyond. Are you getting a sense of of what that could look like? Is it is it fewer overall tournaments? Is it a fall that either doesn't exist or really doesn't matter for the top 70 players in the world? Is it more cooperation with the DP World Tour in incorporating some of those Rolex Series events? Like, what's your what's your sense on what this could actually look like? I, I believe it's still uh, under construction, so to speak, uh, with PJ Tour Brass. No, I think it is. I was actually talking with a tournament director uh, of, of an event later in the summer that is not a designated event. And he was telling me that his sponsor is interested in becoming a designated event, or at the very Are least, they all? probably not. I mean, because it's a big price tag. I mean, it, I don't know if it's everyone's pony yeah, in a, a, it's a. It's, it's a double. double. It's, so it's a huge investment for a company to make, whatever the company is. I, I don't care if it's AT and T or an American Express or, or waste management, or whatever the case may be. This is a massive investment over where you are already out at. So you need to not just prioritize golf, but you need to prioritize it to the fact that okay, we need to double our investment to get, arguably, understandably, a better field. So the idea, at least talking with this tournament director, and I've gotten this from other people as well, there are going to be more designated events, whatever that number ends up adding up to be. Whether if that the minimum is going to be 20, 24, whatever the case may be, you can't add too many more than that because those players just aren't I mean, going to play you, more. If you have 20 designated events instead of 13, just, why don't you just make the entire tour a designated event? Uh, I, I think it's going to be more of a rotation. So, for example talking with people this week and a few weeks ago when I was in Los Angeles for an event, I think what we're going to end up with in this time frame, for example, is that waste management and next week, the farmer's insurance at Torrey Pines will probably just rotate. It'll be in every other year, which probably makes the tournament happy, certainly makes uh, the sponsors happy because you're getting a really good field every other year, but you're not having to pay for it every year. So that looks much, much better on the bottom line sheet. Now, you asked also about the fall. There's going to be a fall. I don't think anybody knows exactly what it's going to look like now. And you're right. The top 70 players, probably more than that, aren't going to have any interest in it whatsoever. So what it's going to become is a glorified corn fairy tour or maybe an extended Q school, however you want to look at it. And and I do think that they work some of those DP World Tour events. I think the Scottish Open is is an obvious one. I think both you and I both thought that that would have been part of the first wave of designated events that come in. But certainly you look at the Scottish Open, the BMW PGA, which is their flagship event, some of the events in Abu Dhabi or Dubai. I mean, all of these would fit nicely into, let's face it, into what they want to turn into a world schedule. That's what I'm saying. Like, if we're, if we're doing pie-in-the-sky stuff, if, if that's exactly what we want to do in, in 2024 is have this worldwide global schedule, basically what Live Golf is doing just on steroids. Yeah, you'd incorporate Abu Dhabi, you'd incorporate Dubai, you'd incorporate the deep, the BMW PGA, you would incorporate the Irish, Scottish, um, I mean, you could do the Spanish, Italian Open, like all of those tournaments are fantastic on the DP World Tour schedule as standalones, and it could really bolster those in the DP World Tour, and I think make for much more interesting, and it's just, it's just, just a dissimilar vibe to what we get on the PJ Tour, which is so much sameness, right? Like the Zurich, it, it, I would I would say is probably going to get hurt by the schedule this year, but that was such a, a departure from the norm of the 72-hole stroke play that could become so monotonous throughout the tour season. I'd just love to see different venues, uh, different locales, uh, but that is clearly still 
uh, up for debate on what that is going to look like in 2024. Let's get into this field, Rex. It is uh, five of the top seven in the world, eight of the top 15, 10 of the top 20, however you want to slice it. John Rahm has to be the headliner. You think about what he has done in his last five worldwide starts, three wins, uh, also a T2 and a T4. He is not just the de facto number one this week. He is the prohibitive number one. If you had a chance to talk to John Rahm, or what did your Tuesday consist of at PJ West? Did not talk to John Rahm. Didn't even see him at the golf course today. He's scheduled to hold a press conference tomorrow at PGA West, so of course we'll talk to him there. And I wanted to float this by you. Uh, and we, we all know John, he's got a sense of humor. He, he, he does have a personality. I do like spending time around John. But like, if you touch the wrong button, he doesn't, he doesn't play along. So I was thinking about starting the press conference tomorrow with the idea that, John, congratulations. Last week without playing, you moved up from number five in the world to number four in the world. Good for you. Thoughts, please. And he doesn't. He does not have an opportunity this week to rise to world number one. But you know who does? But he can move to two or three. Correct. I haven't done the math. But, but you he know, can still who, move up. But you know who can move to world number one this week? Scotty Scheffler. I can only assume. Patrick Cantlay, who is one spot behind John Rahm in the world rankings. Uh, so can Scotty Scheffler, right? That is your leadoff. Quote. Yes. Yep. Both um, those players. But John Rom cannot. At the John risk of you dragging what is a pretty good podcast into the mud here, give me the Cliff Notes version of how that is possible. It's something like a Cantlay win and a Scheffler worse than ninth place finish, I believe. There's actually a scenario. It's a very weird one. According to uh, my guru, your guru, everyone's guru. Nosferatu. Nosferatu. Both, both Scotty Scheffler and Patrick Cantlay could share the world number one title if it does play out that way. But John Rahm, who is one spot higher in the world rankings, does not have an opportunity to, to rise to world number one. But Patrick Cantlay, number five, as opposed to John Rahm's number four, does have an opportunity. That is your first question. That one's pretty good. Yeah, because he, he voiced his, uh, John Rahm voiced his frustration in Maui. And, and I kind of wrote about it the next week, pointing out that I, I agree with him where he's coming from. When you look at what he has done, Let's just go back three months now. And I, I could argue that Tony Finau has had a similar run, but if you just look at the quality of fields, I mean, he won the DP World Tour Championship, which is an elite field. Like, look, it's, it, it didn't qualify as that in the world ranking and the new math. He won in Maui. Again, very much an elite field. However, because it's a short field, it probably got hurt on rankings points. And when he win, won in Maui, he moved from number five in the world to number five in the world. And there was a level of frustration that I can understand. Uh, I certainly get that. Like I, I, I think if you look at, at, at Data Golf, John Rahm, I believe, is number two. Roy Mac, like Roy hasn't played in two months. It's, it's easy to forget just how well he was playing. He had uh, just a single finish outside the top ten uh, since last June. It's not like uh, the dude uh, has, been, has been scuffling. He's just literally not playing. Now, John Rahm, if you're looking at who is the favorite this week, uh, I think it would be quite obvious it would be John Rahm. But Scotty Scheffler has played fine. It seems to have, have, have kicked off um, kind of that, that rough patch, I think, that was kind of uh, started at the, the Tour Championship, final round, uh, uh, dismal final round there to kick away a six-shot lead to Roy McIlroy. It uh, cost him the FedEx Cup title. So Scotty Scheffler uh, has, has four consecutive tens as well. I was curious, Rex, Xander Schauffele is in the field, is going to play this week at mm -hmm. PGA West. Last we heard from him, uh, he withdrew... Uh, during the second round of the Century Tournament of Champions with a bad back. Uh, said it was an issue that has been dogging him over the past couple of months. Had an MRI last week in Las Vegas. What's the deal? What's, what's the deal with Xander? Uh, I talked to him today, and he's very confident. Uh, he, again, he voiced a level of frustration in Maui that I, I was kind of surprised at. He talked about having to, I think the word he wore was powder puff his way around the plantation yes. course because of his ailing back. Some, and, something you were very familiar with. Yes, powder puffing my way around golf courses. And then, of course, he had to withdraw from there. But I, I spoke with him today, and he feels like everything's in place. And he, and he also, he, I feel like he wanted to clarify some things in Maui. He, he kind of made some comments about maybe I shouldn't have worked out and this wouldn't have happened. I tried to get myself in better shape, and, and here I am in this situation. And, and I think what he, what he really – He was being, a joke. He was being facetious, yes. Yes, I mean, and I think that's what he kind of wanted to get through today. Were people, that, were people look, taking that seriously? I mean, I wouldn't think so, but who knows in, in this day and age of, you know, everyone's going to 
take a morsel of what you said and turn it into whatever their agenda is. So I can certainly see where his aggravation was so coming did, from. So what did what did the MRI say? Is it a muscular issue? Nothing. Is it a structural issue? He has nothing. It's, it's, it's not structural. So I didn't follow up on the muscular. So, I mean, it just stands to reason that it's muscular. He, he I watched him play a couple of holes today. He's swinging the ball well. He feels confident. He knows this golf course well enough. So I, I think... I wouldn't expect him to come out here and win simply because there's going to be some rust after having not played for as long as he have. But I, I would be surprised if he doesn't make the cut and play decent because I just feels feel like that's where his game is. I mean, when you go back and you look at what he said when he withdrew from Maui, he said, if, you know, if you put my life on the line to finish, of course I could finish. But everyone around him was telling him to stop playing, which is probably the best advice he probably could have gotten. Because anytime you're in a situation like that, just don't play. It's easier to say, you know what, I withdrew instead of trying to explain three years from now that I should not have played that last round in Maui, right? Wouldn't the same logic apply to this week then? If he, if he literally just underwent an MRI seven days ago, regardless of if it's cleared, he, he, he obviously had and was experiencing enough discomfort and it had been plaguing him for now a month plus, why wouldn't you just give yourself an extra week? He's playing uh, next week the Farmers Insurance Open, at least he's uh, part of the early field list in what was at least it used to be a home game at Torrey Ponds. You're making a squinchy face. Squinchy face, he's not going to play? Uh, he may not. He may not. Look, and, and uh, he may withdraw from this week. I mean, uh, why, I think... In, why, why play this week? Same reason I'm doing this podcast, and I clearly have something wrong with my elbow and shoulder now after holding this five-pound mic. Uh, no, I, I think he would not be here this week if he thought, one, he was going to hurt himself anymore or two his body wasn't 100 percent and he wasn't able to perform that much is clear like I, I don't think there was any part of his answers to me today that ran on golf central later uh this evening that that suggests that you know maybe he's only 80 percent or 70 percent or whatever the case may be i feel like in his mind his game is where it needs to be and probably internally those around him his camp so to speak they just probably needed to see an mri and just make sure that okay he can't hurt this, whatever this is, he can't aggravate it or cause any more damage going forward. And it's just something we have to find a way to manage. So at this point, yeah. it's about finding a way to manage it more so than it is some sort of rehab or recovery. Very interesting. He has such a busy schedule. It's going to be four of the next five weeks on the PGA Tour, assuming he plays next week in Torrey Pines and what used to be a home game. If, if, you're, if, you're going with, if you're undergoing an MRI last week, it seemed like this would have been the week that you would take off before you get healthy for what is a very busy schedule leading up to the Masters. Rex, there should be some news this week as it pertains to Live Golf, which is reportedly on the verge of announcing a broadcast deal to be shown on the CW Network, uh, which is not known for having sports properties, but is available in more than 200 U.S. markets. This is kind of what Live Golf has been waiting for as everyone knows in 2022 all their events streamed on youtube with very meager streaming numbers and audience levels this uh was an absolute must-have before live golf kicked off its season uh, it's his first league format season in mid-february what's your takeaway from what is soon to be announced uh, by live golf officials we had talked about this. So the, the two main things that Live Golf needs to, to fix, let's say, going forward, was a domestic TV deal. You're right. Like, whatever it is they were doing on YouTube just wasn't working. It, it simply isn't going to resonate with the audience that they need to have to make this financially viable. I don't know that the CW, which had been sort of rumored in that mill for a long time, it was Fox, it was CW, there was a couple of other um, suitors. But I don't know if CW was the landing spot that they wanted, but it's probably the landing spot that they needed at this point in time because they needed to find some sort of solution to at least half that problem because the world ranking problem is not going away anytime soon there's no reason for the world ranking to make a decision anytime soon on whether if they get world ranking points or not there's i mean obviously live is motivated for them to make that decision but the world ranking and everyone around the world ranking would much rather just wait and see how it plays out as far as the tv deal goes it's going to help i don't know if it's going to be that boost that gets them across sort of that financial finish line that makes them financially viable. Because we can all agree that whatever's happening now is not financially viable based on just what we know publicly. We know how much most of those players got paid. And for you to find a way to monetize that is going to be different. But this is a step. Uh, it's certainly a, a step. There's at least now a potential source of revenue. It's, it was going to be absolutely imperative that once they start trotting out this franchise model, 
that these guys are seen on TV if they want to appeal to any sort of corporate sponsorships and players building out their various franchises. And so it's going to be widely distributed at this point. Uh, people may have to search for the CW, uh, but that's not all that dissimilar uh, from other sports leagues, which are branching out on some of these uh, networks that are more north for, more north for like syndicated programming as opposed to an FS1 and FS2 which is what or Live Golf was prob- poorly doing, looking at last fall. Probably the best example I would give is MLS signing the deal. I believe it was with Apple, where all of the MLS games are now going to just stream on the Apple platform. That's clearly not a traditional platform that a sports league would look at. However, I think you're going to start seeing more and more. Even the NFL is sort of flirting with the idea we're going to have a game on Amazon right next uh, ne- next no- uh, November on, bl- on on the Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. So I think you're going to see more and more of that. And my guess is, if I had to guess, that this is whatever the, the deal is between Live and CW is a very short term deal. They didn't sign a ten year agreement to this. They just want to find a way to get on the board and then find a way to move forward. Yeah, I've seen multi year deal uh, with some sort of revenue sharing arrangement. They're not going to have to buy time, uh, which is what uh, Live Golf was reportedly going to have to do last fall with Fox Sports. So this is clearly step one, Rex. Step two, step three, whichever number it is is its full roster of players. That has not yet been announced. The Live Golf season kicks off in about four weeks' time. We still do not know the official 48 players uh, who are going to be teeing it up uh, in Mexico. Mito Pereira, as you reported, as you first reported, GolfChannel.com exclusive that Mito Pereira was heading to Live Golf in August. He's the only name that I've seen mentioned who's supposed to be among the latest signees. Keep in mind, Rex, keep in mind Live Golf CEO Greg Norman said back in November that he was eyeing six or seven more players. He was going to retain 85 to 90% of the current live roster. You hearing any rumblings about who could round out these signings? Or is Mito Pereira, who came within four strokes away in the PGA Championship last year, is he kind of the the biggest of the signings? Uh, I've talked with people, enough people who are sort of, who are connected enough and understand I've talked with people. I've talked with people. How about that for journalistic integrity? Uh, No, I believe seven is the number that most people are, are sort of dealing with right now, that they're going to add seven. Now, keep in mind, it's not only going to be 48, but you're also going to have each team going to be required to have a reserve. So then you can add, what, 12 more after that? Mm-hmm. And, and so there is going to be some sort of filter system. So if this guy's not playing, he's going to be relegated, and the next guy's going to have to step up. Mito would be the one. Uh, there's one or two other names that I've heard, but uh, as we've talked about this, like I'm so reluctant to give any credence to the rumors that you hear because there's been way more rumors than not probably the bigger deal tomorrow if we want to get into the legal weeds a little bit there will be sort of a deadline tomorrow in in the in the lawsuit in san jose between live golf and the pga tour and this involves the public investment fund of saudi arabia which of course i actually found out today this is news i didn't realize this the number that had been thrown out was the PIF owns 86% was the number that I think most of us were going on of Live Golf. According to the most recent filings, that is 94%. Uh, hmm. which, is, which is interesting only because... So it literally the, is the Saudi tour. Well, the deadlines... I, um, wow, that, that would talk about me losing my journalistic integrity. Take it easy there. It's literally, um, it's literally the Saudi tour. The Saudis own it. It's the Saudi well, golf tour. And that's what the deadline's going to deal with. So the PIF, the Public Investment Fund, that's behind Live Golf, as well as its governor, have been su- subpoenaed by the PGA Tour because the argument is they run the day-to-day operations, therefore they're behind the lawsuit and what went into wooing these players away. And, and the art tour is arguing, forced them to, to break their contracts with the PGA Tour. And so they're being pulled in the lawsuit and they're fighting this. Obviously, apparently there was some sort of shareholder agreement that just came to light that I think kind of comes to a head tomorrow. So what you're going to end up with is instead of it being Live versus the PGA Tour, it's going to be the PIF versus the PGA Tour, which is an entirely different scenario. Yeah, it's, that's not being derogatory. If 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 the PIF owns 94% of Live Golf, like that is the Saudi Golf Tour. It's That's what the PGA Tour has been referring to them uh, for basically a year now. That's essentially... What is it we're finding out in these court filings? Like it is the Saudi golf tour. Uh, no, there's there's no denying that. And look, I don't I don't think anyone's going to sit here and say that it wasn't behind it. That, but the, today's filing, well, what's going to happen tomorrow? Went all the way back into the weeds to the earliest to the PGL and how the Saudis were interested in that. And then once that sort of unraveled, they sort of created their own plan. I think we've talked about it before. Project Wedge is what it was called in the earliest vestiges. And just and it's interesting because. 
the governor of the PIF, which the PIF is almost, it's three quarters of a trillion dollar fund. It's the second largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. They have sizable investments in pretty much any large company you can think of from Uber to FedEx. I mean, you can keep going down the road. But like what you're seeing in the court filing is that the governor of the PIF w was involved with not just the day-to-day -day operations, but the individual negotiations between Live Golf and players as far as what they wanted to get paid, what Live wanted to pay them. That's fascinating to me. I can barely balance my own checkbook and do my day job. How does he do that? <laughs> I mean, that's the governor, right? He's, he's the governor. The the, governor. He's yeah, the yes, governor. Yes, he's the governor. Yep. He's the governor. Yep. That's right. Yep. We're going to be doing a, a special edition of the podcast, the Golf Channel podcast with Rex and Lav. I'll literally just ask one question and you can just talk for 45 minutes. That'll be, do you want to do that on Wednesday? That sounds like do, me. You want to just do it all legalese, even, that though sounds you're not like... a, even though you're not a legal expert, you want to just do it all legalese podcast? What could, what could possibly go wrong? I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to play one on the podcast. No, it's interesting. And uh, it, because there was a hearing last week, it, it, everyone felt like something big was going to happen. And look, I don't, this is one step in a very long process, but it is, a, it is an interesting step to me. Uh, Rex, this is your first tournament on the road in about a month. You're like a, you're like a, a caged animal uh, who's finally been set free and able to run amok all over the Coachella Valley. Uh, tell me you're hitting up the nest this week. What else is on your uh, itinerary in Rancho Mirage? Uh, I stopped by the Beer Hunter tonight for a, a quick burger and a beer before I, I had to run back from, uh, for the podcast with uh, some of the folks from the crew. That's always good. The Beer Hunter, you guys should check it out. And uh, haven't been to the Nest in a long time. That's a dangerous place. I don't Jeff think Rude. you roll up to the Nest Jeff Rude in, a, to the in nest. a Tesla. I don't think you roll up to the Nest in a Tesla. That's you know, a bad you can, look. You can roll up there in a Kia, though. <laughs> a Ford Focus. I have, I have, I have before, and I'm sure that I will again. My grandparents used to live at Rancho Mirage. That was quite a haunt uh, for us back. In the what day. was it like and when you went to the nest? <clears throat> uh, I was with Jeff Rude, yeah, who at the time was probably in his mid late fifties, probably your probably your age now. Uh, he mm -hmm. was in his element. Uh, me being, I m must have been mid twenties at that time, was very much not. It was clear that I you, it was clear that I was the outlier uh, in that scenario, but I was more than no. happy to play as wingman. You were the hunted, is what you were. <laughs> happily That's married, right. happily married, happily married. You were the hunted. Both is then, what you were. both, 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 both then and now. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's a very frightening place. Haven't been back in a long time. Probably won't go back anytime soon. Yep, absolutely. Rex, you are going to be missing uh, the best football weekend of the year. You, look, I'm sure the American Express will be a fantastic tournament, and you'll greatly Super Wild enjoy. Card Weekend wasn't the best football weekend of the year? No. Your Jaguars absolutely. won. And yeah, now they're going to lose by 40 uh, to the Chiefs, which is a problem, Rex, because I was actually thinking about getting uh, season tickets for the Jags next year. I figure if I go to three or four games, it's fine. It probably pays for itself, and you can sell the tickets that you don't use. Now you go ahead and beat the Chargers. You've advanced – uh, this far in the playoff for the first time in five years, I think it's pretty obvious that they have a, a, a nucleus, a core, uh, to be successful in the future. Dougie P uh, is a heck of a ball coach. Those ticket prices, something tells me those are about to skyrocket, regardless of whether they lose by 40 points to the Chiefs, which I fully expect them to do. Uh, this, is a, this is all of a sudden a hot ticket. Like Duvall is absolutely on fire for the Jags, understandably so. Maybe if you quit putting additions onto your house, it wouldn't be an issue. <clears throat> an update on that uh the outdoor kitchen should be done should be done rex in two weeks uh the video sent me looks good we're going to have to uh post a video when it's done so everyone sees and, and oh, enjoys yeah. partakes we're gonna, be, we're gonna have to do some hashtag content uh coming out of there if you folks help pay for if, it if if anyone's yeah if anyone's listening to this who would like to sponsor any sort of grilling golf tailgating debauchery uh, type golf content, uh, you know where to find us on Twitter or on email. We're certainly going to be putting that out, whether or not we have a sponsorship <laughs> attached or not. But it would certainly be fun uh, if we had products to hawk as well. Rex, I hope you enjoy the week at the American Express. I'll be enjoying it in my under construction backyard, watching the best football weekend of the year. We will reconvene next week on the Golf Channel podcast with Rex and Lav. If Rex just so happens to grace us with his fine writing, make sure to go to golfchannel.com for all of our news and updates. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Tesla.